Welcome, geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to another all-new edition of Geeks Me Radio. Today's episode 195, we are joined by John Greasley and Greg King of King Soundworks, talking about their work on the brand new Hulu hit, Books of Blood. Then we'll be talking with actor Eric Martzoff about Rideshare, the series on Digital Sky, as well as his work in Days of Our Lives and Smallville, and so much more. Stand by. We're talking TV, comics and movies. Star Trek from Star Wars will try to explain The Andrew Dodgers for Hogwarts houses One ring rolls and more To be the greatest Pokemon master You must catch them all You must catch them all And for those of you who are finding us for the first time, welcome to the show. My name is James Enstall. I'm your host. Every week we try to bring you some pop culture fun from the world of TV, movies, video games, and comic books. And we have three great guests. We're going to go right to our first segment. Right now we're talking with the gentleman from King Soundworks, John Greasley and Greg King, talking about their latest projects, working on Hulu's last horror film, Books of Blood, perfect for the Halloween season. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Of course. I looked through your... I am. I, let me try that again. I looked through your IMDb pages, <laughs> and uh, one of the projects that always stands out for me, because we have actually spoken with J. Miles Dale, the producer uh, who on many projects, and Greg, you worked on Friday the 13th, the series, which remains one of my favorite series of all times. <sighs> That is so funny you say that because (laughs) I just discovered um, a Facebook group called Friday the 13th, the series, and I had no idea there was this whole legions of fans out there. And, um, yeah, and I actually have um, a prop from the first season. I think it's episode six or episode seven. It's Vanity's Mirror. Oh, And I have it here in my office with me, the cracked mirror. Um, it was given as a gift at the end of the season and I've had it all those years and I posted photos and it's like the most responses I think I've ever had on a Facebook post was me posting those photos of that, uh, of the, of the cursed object from that episode. Yeah. I was going to say it's probably too big to have that huge dollhouse in your apartment somewhere. Uh, cause that was a huge piece that the, the kids crawled into and they, they like had their own universe inside. That was probably mm-hmm. one of the more terrifying episodes i saw but yes it was a great series and you both worked on so many great series uh both together and separately uh the orville uh jane the virgin crazy ex-girlfriend all these great projects talk a little bit about how the two of you met john and i met through um joel schrack who's one of our longtime sound supervisors and adr supervisors here and um and joel was uh teaching classes at um it was the la recording school wasn't it yeah LA, LA recording school LA film school yeah exactly the, the sort of two together and uh, Joel uh, said hey there's a there's a guy here who's in one of my classes who I think is just a really good fit I really like his personality he's really sharp but I think he'd, he'd really fit in will you meet him and and so yeah Joel brought him in and and um, and Joel was right about everything he said about John he said, John <laughs> John started with us and, and he was, I mean, he was, John was experienced in the sense that he wasn't like a 21 year old kid coming out of school. He had actually had a, a career as a, to put it mildly, a rock star. And then when he decided <laughs> he went the rock star life anymore, he got in a post. So he was, um, he was already had experience in the studio and experience performing and all that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. And, uh, so um, he just he just became a great sound designer. He started, even though he was a more mature guy when he joined us, he did start at the, from the foundation. And um, and now not only is John a mixing partner on as many of the projects I can work with him on, he works independently here on his own projects as well as part, as, as well as mentoring younger guys here too. But uh, John's like my right hand man at the company now, and and 
on the creative side and on the sound side. And, um, you know, he, he's like our production manager and make sure everything goes smoothly. And, and like I said, creatively mentors a lot of the other guys. So he's, he's, uh, uh, from a guy I didn't meet that long ago. He's, uh, he's, he's like my main man and, and very integral part of the operation here. And John, how did you get involved in sound work? Was it something you kind of as a little kid had a fascination with? Was it something you kind of fell into? Talk a little bit about how you got into it. Yeah, I mean, it really does. I can I can remember all as a kid. You get the, you used to have those little um, like Radio Shack style uh, tape deck thing where you could record your voice onto a cassette, and I would mess around with that. And then as I started playing the guitar in my teens, uh, me and the friends that I started a band with, we got like a four a Tascam four track and made our own demos, um, and then kind of graduated up onto digital eight tracks, and then started building our own PCs and using uh, Logic Audio back before Apple owned it. And <laughs> it was all just um, in, the, in the name of doing music, uh, you know, recording us. I was making our own demos, writing our own songs. Um, and then after that, uh, I did. I was a professional musician for a while. I say professional musician, that implies I made money, which never happened. <laughs> Um, but you know, I referred to myself as a professional musician at the time, at least. Um, so I did that, uh, put a couple of records out with that same band, uh, that we started in, you know, in our teens and, and traveled around doing that for a while. Um, and that all kind of, uh, you know, it was a, like, it was, I guess it was a great, great journey, but didn't, didn't really seem like it was going to work out very well as a career in the long run. So I ended up trying to f- figure out what I could kind of transition my skill set over to that, that I might possibly be able to maybe make a living at um and i it was around 2005 when i moved to la uh, full time and i did at the time i was thinking about trying to work in uh, recording studios but it, that was right around the time when they were all closing because of the way that digital was kind of taking over and um people were able to record themselves for a lot less money on kind of home built systems so again i was like i've already made one questionable career choice in my life maybe i should try to make a slightly more intelligent one so i started looking into post and i had always been you know really interested in sound effects and sound design for movies you know like as a kid my favorite movies were like ghostbusters or aliens you know where they had like the proton packs or the sound of the xo1 or like the pulse rifle and aliens i was always like that is such a cool sound like it sounds like a gun but it doesn't sound like a gun how do you do that how do you make that so it was kind of a natural um transition for me to go from you know making sounds with instruments to then making sounds uh, in all the other ways that we do with sound design. It's amazing when you think about all the technical work that goes into, you know, syncing it up with the video and having uh, all these sounds sound to an extent in a real world setting, what you'd hear. And then you're brought in to work on Hulu's horror film books of blood. And the sound work obviously is very integral to this, but it's also from what I understand, uh, you had a lot of uh, leeway to kind of create this kind of, outlandish sounds in a way too so talk a little bit about working on this particular project we'll start with greg you know we had worked with the director brandon before brandon uh Braga, the director um he was also one of the directors and and lead writers on cosmos possible worlds which john and i did and then uh he was also one of the lead writers and one of the executive producers on the orville so we had worked with Brandon before, and we know that uh, Brandon, um, Brandon is a very super intelligent guy. Um, and so we knew that anything that we did, we couldn't just go for scares or, or just outright sort of scary. We had to sort of very approach it from a, a, an emotional and intellectual point of view. Um, and, and, and so that changed our way of thinking of how to see it, knowing that we we're going to be working with Brandon and how he does stuff. And he likes to work that way. We really approach the sound by looking, well, how do we really make this an arc and how do we make, you know, all these different segments of the film tie together and mesh together and feels one and come to the same place at the end. So th- that was kind of, rather than like going to the bucket of, oh, here's our horror sound kind of, here's how we approach a horror movie type bucket we sort of looked at it in a way of like well how do we how do we do this in a way that's also going to be a little intellectual and, and sounds like it's got some thought behind it because that's certainly you know how brandon wrote the screenplay for this and and uh, certainly the way he shot it and with it being uh the fact that obviously jenna suffers from misophonia the hatred of sound these amplified heightened sounds like people chewing and things like that uh and then like greg just alluded to you've worked with brandon before who also from what i understand 
suffers from misophonia to a degree. Uh, John, having already worked with him on projects, it must have been nice to have kind of going into this, but knowing the director and kind of, I guess, having a bit of a shorthand between you. Yeah, that's always really nice to have. Like sometimes when you're working with new people, you're not really sure, you know, how hard to push for certain things or, or what kinds of things to suggest, like maybe how if you have like a crazy idea, you're like, maybe I shouldn't lead with the crazy idea kind of a thing. You're not sure how they're going to react. But with Brannon, uh, yeah, the culture that he established with us on Cosmos was, I don't want to hear it until you guys are happy and you guys do whatever you want to make it so that you're happy with it. So we kind of just thought, you know, if we if we have a crazy idea, let's run with it. And if, and if we think it comes out good, we'll present it to him because he's never going to hold that against us. Um, so yeah, so uh, so obviously he had you know he had direction he wanted us to go in. He had the the psychological elements of the story, like Greg was talking about, that he wanted to convey. But he was really like you know if you this is how I'm thinking of it. But if you think there's a better way this can work, then build it and show and show me. Um, and then yeah, obviously his own uh, sort of semi autobiographical input into the script with his um, you know sensitivities to sound uh, that was an interesting conversation too and. And it was a nice insight for him to be able to kind of explain it to us on a personal level so that we could kind of try to get inside the character of Jenna's head a little bit. Um, and then really try to, that, that of the three kind of anthology style stories in, in the film, that one, we really tried to pick um, large parts of the, of the story to show from her point of view so that you're less like a viewer watching the story and, and more kind of like a participant experiencing it from, from, her, from her perspective. And with uh, you both worked on some incredible projects, like we mentioned earlier, uh, John worked on X-Men Origins Wolverine. Greg has been uh, working on Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, when you're going into the horror genre, from a layman's point of view, me not knowing much about sound design, I would think that sounds are sounds. You've got some stuff you work with. You come up with some new ideas, too. Is it a hard shift going between genres more so than the layman like myself might think it would be? And either one of you uh, or both of you will take this one. Yeah, no, uh, no, because it's all, anytime we're doing sound, our thing is always just to get the audience as involved as humanly possible. So, and so we have different techniques to do that. And, and it translates over to horror perfectly because it's like, for instance, if you're, if you're in a very loud room, like say you're in a nightclub and it's really loud and there's music pounding and people talking and someone behind you goes, Hey, it's not going to startle you or scare you at all. You're already accustomed and you're already attuned to the, the noise and the ambience of the room. But if you're in a dead quiet room alone in a house that's dead quiet, then someone sneaks up behind you and goes, hey, you're going to jump out of your seat. Right. So <laughs> that's that's the trick, really. Is like, it's not per se exactly the sounds you use. It's, it's how you use them. So you, you, want it, you want to be setting things up. You either... You're going to make a decision in a in a in a scene or an act. You're going to pick your beats, and you're going to go, okay. Here's why I want to sort of intentionally push the audience away. You know, I'm going to push them away a bit by making this a little bit louder, a little more cacophonous. Whether I'm doing it with sound effects like background, like traffic sounds, or or birds if we're outside, or crickets at night, or howling wind, whatever the case is, I, I'm going to push them away a little bit here just to, to push them off the screen a bit so that when we go inside the house or we go inside this character's point of view, I can strip some of that away and, and gradually make it really quiet in a subconscious way that the audience doesn't hear you pulling things back and making it quieter. So when that moment comes, when either they see something, think something, or see an apparition or whatever the case is, you've now got the audience in the point where as you're sort of subconsciously pulling things away and making it quieter, they're they're leaning in a little bit more to the screen. They're inching up on their seat a little bit more, you know, uh, not even realizing they're doing that. They're just doing that. So when you do come up with the spots that you either want to make them anxious or make them scared or spook them or what have you, you've already primed them for that moment. Um, and then you want to add a recovery time and sort of calculate and, and figure out the, the process next of how to get them back in that mode for the next thing. So a lot of it, whether you, and that that counts for not only horror movies, but that also works in dramas very effectively. You know, if you want the audience to get in and feel like they're they're really part of the conversation in a drama, or feel the angst, or or what have you. Uh, sort of all genres of film, you kind of use that. You're always looking for those beats of how to how to keep the audience either 
feeling claustrophobic and involved or or pushing them a little way a bit so you can so you can do that later and john would you echo that or add to it in any way yeah, just to add to it, um, I mean, Greg's, he, you know, I, could, I agree with him completely about all of that. The other thing, too, I would say is um, just to go back to the sort of being a musician thing. And Greg is also, he's a he's a, a really good bass player as well. So many of the people that work on uh, Greg's crews, like we've got guitarists, uh, bass players, drummers, you know, vocalists, keyboard players. Um, a lot of people that do sound design are musicians. And in that same sense, um, a scene has a rhythm, not necessarily a rhythm that you would count in an even meter, like if you were tapping your foot to a song, but like all scenes in, in pictures have this kind of inherent rhythm to them. And it's more of a push and a pull and a flow. But once you can kind of tune yourself into the rhythm of the scene, then you know exactly what, you know, if we're going to make that, if the, per, if the actor turns around at a certain point in the scene, you're going to want to cue that with the sound, but how far before, how big of a reaction time do you want to give them? It might not necessarily be completely accurate to reality, but it might be more in tune with the rhythm of the scene. And so all those sorts of things, you know, there's a sense of musicality to the sound design work that you do, even though, like I said, you're not actually counting a beat. And that's all, that translates across any, any well-crafted, put-together scene in any genre. They always have a rhythm. And you both talked about uh, having some musical training and everything like that, working in music. For uh, I'm always fascinated by the behind the scenes, how the movies are made, what all goes into them. Um, with both of you being in sound design and doing all this, obviously the music department comes in, there's musical scores. How much overlap and how closely do the, does the music department work with the sound people to make sure, well, the music can't eclipse this particular sound of the footsteps coming up the stairs and we don't want this to drown out the music as it kind of brings this dramatic effect. How closely do the sound department and the music department work together on these? We'll pause there and come back chatting some more with the gentlemen of King Sounds Works. Stand by. <laughs> Why, hello, this is Scott Innes, better known as the voice of Scooby-Dooby-Doo. Like in Shaggy-Doo, in Scrappy-Doo. In like, in like you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Right, Uncle Scoob? Right, Rappy? Scooby-Dooby-Doo. <laughs> Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. We are talking with John Greasley and Greg King of King Soundworks about their work on various projects and of course uh their new special for hulu and as we were talking to them we asked how closely does the sound department and the music department work together collaboratively on some of these projects as close as possible and and especially in a movie like this and and it and it changes between movies sometimes you're on a movie and you have you might be working on a movie with such a, a big name composer that they're so busy Working on so many projects, it's very, very hard to get, um, you know, get these these conversations and this flow going with them. Um, in the case of in the case of this movie, it, it was great. We were able to work with the guys from from very, very early on and start um, kicking around ideas. And even to the point where we were able, when we had done some initial sound design work, we were able to send it over. So they could kind of hear what we were doing, and then we could continue the conversation about kind of like, well, what are we going to hit? What are you going to hit? Oh, this might be a great moment for score. This might be a better movie for sound design. So in this case, we were able to work closely. And the composer in this case was Joel uh, J. Richard. And so we were able to trade stuff back and forth and have conversations with Joel, which was, which was nice. And then, of course, during the final mix, we have a lot of – then the director gets involved – and then there's a lot of manipulation of the music at that point of how we want to play it, um, whether it should be loud, whether it should be quiet, whether it should even be there at all, whether it should start earlier or later and earlier or later. And a lot of that kind of stuff happens uh, when we're actually mixing. And you both worked on, we mentioned already, so many great projects. Uh, let's, uh, starting with John, do you have a favorite project that you've worked on, be it just from a sentimental point of view or something that was just the most fun you've worked on any one of your tv shows films anything you've done um there was a show it was kind of an ill-fated show that we did a few years ago that i had a ton of fun on um it was funny the, the precursor to it was we had spent a few years doing kind of mostly 
um, you know, multi-camera comedy type stuff. You know, we, like you mentioned that we did Jane the Virgin, we did Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, we had a bunch of shows, all great shows, but um, not super heavy on the conceptual sound design. And I was like really hankering for some sci-fi stuff because that's kind of my favorite genre. And then we got uh, this show called Night Flyers, which was a sci-fi channel adaptation of a George R. R. Martin short story from back in the 80s before he was a, a fantasy writer. So it was kind of like a science fiction horror that takes place all on the ship called the Night Flyer, and it was very psychological, but like super over the top, and like big jump scares and big super crazy like sound design sequences that we had to create. And uh, that was kind of just like a like a smorgasbord of um, you know kind of sound design craziness from my point of view. Just uh, I was the supervising sound designer on that one. Um, and like I said, it was kind of ill-fated. It didn't do very well. It didn't get renewed for a second season, even though the ending was a pretty big cliffhanger. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that one was that one was a lot of fun for me. And Greg? Yeah, it's it's tough because there's all different genres and stuff. It's like um, anything I ever did with Peter Berger, Michael Mann is really really high on the list because uh, they're both great filmmakers and they and they um, they expect you to bring the movie to the next level. Um, out of that, I would probably say the one I may be the most proud of and have the most fond memories of is probably the movie Friday Night Lights. Mm, yeah. um, I really loved working on that movie, uh, having been a, played football when I was a kid and being a football fan. And also just the way it progressed. It's like it's a it's a true story. You know, it, it was written by Buzz Bissinger, who's Peter Berg's cousin, um, who went and lived out there. So, you know, having read the book and then start working on the movie. But what made it really kind of fun was that, you know, for all those football scenes, you know, the live action football scenes they shot, what they ended up doing is they brought in like uh, college football players to do all that kind of stuff. And the college football players didn't want to get hurt because they were worried about their career. So on film, it looks like they're hitting hard. But audio wise, anything that was recorded there. Uh, on the football fields was not good. It was too light and it didn't have any good impacts. So myself and one of my sound editors uh, who worked on the movie, Craig Hannigan and my brother, Darren, and a couple of us, we went in and got duffel bags and filled it with football equipment. And then we went out to football fields and we tackled these things and we did the whole <laughs> the tackle sounds and the hits. And that's what's in the movie. Oh, the wow. movie is like, not NFL guys, not guys on camera. That's that's myself and my sound crew going out to public parks and having people look at us really weird <laughs> as we're ripping this, you know, ripping the shreds out of these tackling dummies that we made. Um, and then, of course, we did the same thing, um, you know, with all the sideline stuff when coaches are yelling at the players from the field. We we brought in professional actors, Loop Group. But again, they were kind of like what they sort of were protecting their voices a little bit. They weren't really to go, and I don't want to blow your ears out, but they weren't really to go like go, 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 run. You know, they that real screaming guttural rip your threads yeah. out, damage to your vocal coach stuff. So that's ended up being myself and my sound crew too doing most of that. So the whole process of doing the, you know, the 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 nature of the film and the fun we had recording the sound effects and doing all the vocal performances for the tackles and the, and the sideline coaches and all that kind of stuff in the end. And, and then the end result is so anytime like a kind of a sports theme comes on, whether it's a documentary or a backstory of a guy, when you're watching TV, it all sort of copies that Friday night light style, you know, it's like with the, it's, it's, so it's fun to see that kind of legacy it had. So that, that movie has a lot of good memories for me. See, the, the unsung heroes of these films are often the sound people. Uh, Kingsoundworks.com <laughs> is the website. You can go check out their work. And uh, we obviously want you to go check out Books of Blood on Hulu. Perfect for this fall Halloween season. Uh, John and Greg, tell people where they can find you on social media. Go ahead. We'll start with John. I'm on, yeah, I mean, I'm on most of them. Uh, my handle on uh, social media is uh, Winston Death, which is actually kind of the pseudonym that I write music under. So it's not all music related stuff, but I post a bunch of, you know, clips of songs and little in studio things that I do there. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's me. And Greg? Yeah, and King, uh, King Soundworks, we have a website. Um, and then um, same with an Instagram um page which is king soundworks um and facebook we have a king soundworks facebook page as well so uh, people can find us there 
And you can also check out their work on Netflix's recent series, Away, and of course, National Geographic's Cosmos, Possible Worlds. John Greasley and Greg King, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And you too. Uh, likewise, James. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. My thanks once again to John Greasley and Greg King. KingSoundWorks.com. Check them out and make sure you check out Little Things. That's the new one they're working on. Should come out next year starring Denzel Washington, Jared Leto, and Rami Malek. What a cast. And they'll also be working on the new one. You've probably seen the previews for it. Songbird. That's with Bradley Whitford and Demi Moore. Uh, pandemic. Filmed during the pandemic about a pandemic uh, by Michael Bay. Check that out. And my thanks once again to both John Greasley and Greg King. We're going to take our next break. Come right back. Chatting with actor Eric Martzoff. So stand by. Hi, this is John Delancey, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. This show wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. And of course, Marcus Theaters, the official movie sponsor of Geek to Me Radio. If you have not yet had a chance to go see a movie, uh, Marcus Theaters, go to the website, check it out. Chances are there is one or two open close by you, 11 different states, plus movie tavern. So you might be able to find a movie tavern if you don't have an actual Marcus Theaters. Uh, same place, always a great place to see a movie. Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern. Get out there. You can check out some of these movies that have released. I know a lot of movies are holding off, but there are still movies to be seen. And in a lot of cases, these movie theaters are offering retro viewings. Like I saw Empire Strikes Back uh, that they were doing, obviously for the 40th anniversary, but at a, a local Marcus Theaters here. It's brilliant. Get out and support these movie theaters. You're supporting these institutions because it's one of those things we don't want to see go away. It's being done safely. I felt perfectly safe. The people I brought with me to some of these movies have felt perfectly safe. Use the Marcus Theaters app. You can download your phone for contactless concessions pickup. And uh, it, the safety precautions they've installed, the extra cleaning, I promise you it is a safe time at the movies. Get out there, support your local theater. MarcusTheaters.com will give you information on where the closest one is to you, movies that are playing. Get your tickets online. All that right from the app as well with Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern. We appreciate them continuing their sponsorship here on geek to me Radio. And with that said, we're going to go right to our next guest. Right now we're joined by Eric Martzoff talking about, uh, among many of his acting projects, his latest one, Digital Skies Ride Share the Series. You can find it on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Eric, how are you? I'm terrific, James. How you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for the time. Uh, I've been a fan of yours for quite a while. Uh, my little okay. backstory: my grandmother moved in with me when we were very young, and she always had to watch her stories. So I was introduced <laughs> to the worlds of soap operas at a very early age. So I've seen you on Passions as Ethan. Uh, I continue to follow you on Days as Brady Black. Uh, Smallville was huge for me. I remember you as Booster Gold, and you've had what an incredible career you've had. I've done some things, you know, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I feel like I'm just I'm just getting started. But um, yeah, it, it's like uh, it's it's been one thing after another, and I've I've been enjoying the ride, that's for sure. But I'm so glad that your your grandmother did you say she got you she got me hooked stories? on soaps. Yes. <laughs> See, we count we count on that man. We count on that circle of life, like you know that bequeathing of the soap opera to the next generation. That's what keeps us going. We're like we've been on the air for 55 years. It's for incredible. God's sakes. Yeah. Long yeah. time. I started back when uh, back when your dad on the show, John, was still Roman Brady. So that's how far back I go. <laughs> yeah, he loves to talk about those <laughs> days, too. And he now you're working stories. on Digital Sky Rideshare, the series, which uh, I've, I've, I'm current with this. It's been great. I wait each Tuesday for these episodes to drop. And it's it's such a blast to listen to. It must be equally fun to work on, I would think. It really is. You know, it's it's something different. I always like to throw my throw my hands into things that kind of make me nervous and, and I'm not sure what they are, you know, as, as an actor, you try to find projects that, that, that instill a little bit of, you know, unknown and fear in your belly. You're like, what am I getting into? And th this was one of those things that when they presented it to me, I didn't quite understand. I was like, this is a hybrid of an audio visual podcast of a guy who cons people out of technological advances in our society. And we, we, we what, what, <laughs> I was like, this, it just it just sounded interesting to me, and it it's been a, a wild ride. We have some just terrific voice talent on these on these uh, these episodes, and the production quality is what really blows me away. You really feel like you're in these environments. I mean, when you're in a car, you feel like you're in a car. When you're in a club, you feel like you're in a club. And they 
the post production is amazing. I'm blown away by it. And we had James Gavsey, one of the producers. He's a friend of the show. We've had him on uh, right before the first episode dropped to talk about the series. And he likened the character of Keith to a little bit of Dexter, a little bit of James Bond, a little bit of Bruce Wayne. And I posited, it, yeah. especially now, I'm getting Danny Ocean vibes from Ocean's Eleven. So it's kind of like all these things. That's got to be such a fun totally. character to play. James, you freaking nailed it. I thought of that as well. As a matter of fact, that was on, that was on TV a couple nights ago, and I'm watching – you know, George Clooney and Brad Pitt doing their thing and, and Rob and Andy Garcia out of the, out of all his, you know, millions at the Bellagio. And I'm thinking to myself in the back of my head, this is key. This, this <laughs> is what he does. He like, you know, makes friends with everyone and smiles and winks and then he steals all your shit. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so um, he's kind of the dude that we all want to be. Uh, who doesn't want to be James Bond and and Dexter, in a way, we all have that dark side where we'd love to do some horrible things to some people that really bug us in the world, but we don't do it because we have morality. You know, where our parents taught us right. You know, just because someone deserves to you know, be tied down to a table and have their eyelids plucked out doesn't mean you should do it. <laughs> exactly. That's but, why I always um, remind myself every morning, I can't do it. <laughs> exactly. Keith's that guy. He's the guy we all want to be. So it's, it's, it's really fun to, to go on these adventures with him every week. As much as I love Lydia, my, one of my favorite episodes so far was episode three with Wyatt because he kind of finds, uh, I wouldn't want to say a kindred spirit, but he, he lets this guy go. And it's very, uh, by the end of the episode, I don't want to spoil it for people who may not be current, you end up rooting for Keith, which is so what, not what you should be doing. You should be rooting for Wyatt. And it's, uh, it's a bizarre twist that uh, kind of takes you down this psychological path. Exactly. And, and that's what that's what the writers, that's what Scott and the crew have have carefully constructed is a story where in which this con man, this this completely unlikable guy could in any way have a likability factor. You know, it's, it's like all our favorite guys. You, you look at Batman and you're like, wow, this this dude is a vigilante, he does some really horrible things to people. He hangs guys off of buildings, but he's doing it for all the right reasons, though. So do I like him? I don't know. Is he a villain? I'm not sure. And I've, I've had that experience with my character, Brady Black, on Days of Our Lives, oh, sure. too. I mean, here's here's a guy who just wants domestic bliss. He wants to find love. He wants to find that special someone. But at the same time, if you cross him, he'll bury you alive, which he's done in the past. He stuck a woman in a sarcophagus. Poor Vivian. You know, with a video camera in there so he could laugh at her. <laughs> and so he's he's not – just when you think they're Dudley Do-Rights – they're not. And that's what I think. God, that's what makes people interesting to me is the layered factor. You don't always need to be Superman. Once in a while, you can throw some Joker into it and then you have someone interesting. And as know. much as I love Louise Sorrell, Vivian did have it coming when you buried her alive. I got to say <laughs> a nice call on that. Look at you calling out <laughs> Louise Sorrell. You know your stuff, man. I try. And you also mentioned Batman. Obviously, uh, you played Booster Gold in Smallville, which was it was the superhero show before we had the CW with Arrow and the Flash. Uh, oh, yeah. Were you a comic book fan before you got the part in that show? Well, my well, one of my good buddies, he played the Green Arrow, Justin Hartley, on Smallville oh, yeah. uh, for a while. And, and he kept saying to me, he's like, dude, come on. you got to get on this show. And I'm like, I'm trying. I'm trying. And I, I actually uh, I auditioned for Hawkman. At one point, didn't get that. And this last minute call came in for Booster Gold. And I'll be completely honest with you. I didn't know who Booster was. I didn't know he was a member of the Justice League. He hasn't had a show yet. He hasn't had a lot of just just the kind of exposure that you would think a dude like this would have. And finally, they threw him into the Smallville series, the third to the last episode. And this character ended up literally giving Clark the idea for his you know name of Superman. And I didn't know he had such an impact on the on the dc universe as he does so i'm hoping that more projects come down the pipeline for booster i hear rumblings in the industry about possible projects movie series i don't know but it's time for booster and the blue beetle to get together and, and just kick some ass i mean they, they could do so much so many interesting things in the sense that he's a he's from the you know he's from the future he's a time traveler right so he and flash he and flash could get along in multiple universes you know <laughs> And then we had uh, Mark Guggenheim, who was the kind of the architect of this crisis on infinite earths. And I was kind of asking him, did you know, did you get Eric to come back for Booster Gold? Because they had all these little cameos throughout the years. I was really hoping you might pop up. Was it approached? Mm -hmm. you all? Did you, was it discussed? And we'll pause right there. Take our next break. Come back and continue our chat with actor Eric Martzoff. Stand by.
This is Michael Rosenbaum. You might know me as Lex Luthor or Martin X from Guardians of the Galaxy. And you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Why am I talking like this? Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. The show, again, we are here because of our sponsors. Uh, Our premier sponsor is the City of St. Charles, the Greater Convention and Visitors Bureau. I've talked about them since the beginning because they've been with me since the beginning. The website is discoverstcharles.com, discoverstcharles.com. Go check them out if you're looking to plan a trip. We just heard the news that Macy's, historically in New York, will be the first time in 157 years they've not had a Santa Claus. Uh, COVID has taken its impact. The Legends and Lanterns Festival that went off in St. Charles did it brilliantly. Social distancing, uh, mask wearing, everything went fine. It was great. They're doing it again for Christmas. They're going to replicate literally the magic. And if you're in the greater St. Louis, St. Charles area, they're going to have a Santa Claus. And they're going to do it in a COVID safe way where you can still get that photo op with your children while being safe. The city is bent on making sure of your safety as well as the safety of of the people performing. Uh, The festival director is a friend of mine, and he is also very, very cautious to make sure this is being handled in a proper and safe way. So uh, more than ever, City of St. Charles has something for everyone, and you should check out the website, Discover ST Charles, get the dates, find out the times, the places, and where you can go for your family photos with Santa or with Krampus, if you're of that. They have Krampus knocked on Wednesday and Friday nights, and it's as we always say, an historically good time. Check out the website, discoverstcharles.com for more information there. Before we took our last break, we were chatting with actor Eric Martzoff, and I'd asked him, uh, obviously, uh, with we had Mark Guggenheim on the show before talking about crisis. I asked Eric directly, was there any discussion of bringing Booster Gold in for the big Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover? Uh, dude, I'll be honest. I'd love to say that I was approached, but I didn't hear a peep uh, and, thus far. Maybe they're just waiting to, you know, Drop the big one and That's make right. the giant movie, you know, <laughs> Bo- Booster Gold versus the Avengers or something, you know, this would work. Let's just, <laughs> just go big or go home. That's what Booster would say. And it makes you feel better. I did speak with we had Dan Jurgens, a prolific comic book writer and the creator of Booster Gold on the show a couple of years back. And I asked him about your performance. He said you nailed it. So high praise. Well, that is cool. Thank you for passing that along. Of I appreciate that. You and, know, it was Jeff Johns that Jeff Johns was the one that actually wrote that Smallville episode. And he's been instrumental and, uh, in all these. Yeah, he wrote it and, and Tom Welling directed it. That's I don't right. Know if you knew that That's as well. That's right, yes. Yeah. Tom was the one throwing me around. He stuck me in that harness when the blue boat when the blue beetle had me in that chokehold and left me up there for dinner. <laughs> kind That's... of a kind of a new guy on set prank. They're like, Okay, dinner, and I'm still hanging in this harness, getting fed pizza. You know, from seven feet off the ground. The joys of acting. Of course. It's all glorious. And obviously, uh, your turn on Days of Our Lives, uh, also on Passion. So you replaced the actor originally playing the role. Is there any pressure you feel when you're coming into a a role like that where someone else has already kind of had their hands on the character? Or is it just kind of a challenge to make the character your own? How do you approach that? Thankfully, I, I think I took the right approach, and my whole daytime career has been based on recasts. I've only played two characters in my 18 years of being on soaps, and that's Ethan and Brady, both of which are recasts. I went, to, I went into it basically like I did with a sports mentality. I said, you know what? I, I have the ball now. It's my ball. So yeah. I'm going to run with it. I'm going to pass. I'm, I'm going to do whatever I choose to do and make my plays. And all the while, you hold on to the historical integrity. You don't change the history of the character. But as far as who he is and whose skin he's in, it's it's my football to carry now. So no, I don't I don't put a lot of pressure on myself in that realm uh, because you know the the, the 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 best weapon that we as actors have is ourselves. No nobody else can be you. Yeah. So you got to instill some of you. If you go in there just trying to do a caricature or, a, or an impersonation. Or a copycat version, it's it's not going to come off as genuine. You got it. You got to throw yourself into the character and integrate that somehow. I think that's what makes recasting successful. And uh, we put on Facebook and Twitter that we were going to have you on and uh, asked if any questions. Uh, we have Karen Blanky asked, "Who have you learned the most from? What other actor have you learned the most from on your time on Days of Our Lives?" Oh, wow. Well, there was a there was a wonderful actor named Ben Masters on Passions, 
And uh, I remember my first week, I was I was a little frustrated with the lunacy of the storyline. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was like, because Ethan Winthrop, he just like, I, would hold, I was like, hold on a second. This guy for years, he just has a crush on the housekeeper's daughter and he's married the whole time. Like he can't make up his mind. This is crazy. <laughs> and Ben put his hand on my shoulder. He said, son, don't read the script. Read the check. <laughs> <laughs> That's some great advice. I was like, I was like, okay, Ben, you got a point there, but I still want to, you know, I'm glad to be making a living, but I still want the story to be somewhat good and realistic. He's like, realistic, <laughs> buddy, you're in daytime television right now. So, <laughs> I've I've learned to embrace the craziness, the the escapism of soaps, and coming from passions where it was just supernatural and just nutty, off the charts. I'm okay with the with the silly storylines that do come about. And look, days of our lives, we've we've dove into that swimming pool of crazy as well. We have a mad German scientist running around bringing people back from the grave with a lovely syringe full of magic stuff. <laughs> so you know, you just got to wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to I'm going to do this. And yeah, and people people. They want to escape. That's what they use soap opera for. Of course. They want to forget about this pandemic. They want to forget about their bills and their mortgage and, and their uncle that they can't stand and, and throw themselves into a soap opera. And I've always said that, you know, if you think you have problems, tune into Channel 4 on NBC at 1 o'clock and watch Brady. <laughs> exactly right. Because his, <laughs> his issues are nothing compared to yours. He, he, I mean, he just he was just sleeping with uh, his ex-girlfriend who was wearing a mask of his other ex-girlfriend. Right. Right. You know, and he couldn't tell the difference. Who used you to know, babysit man... his current <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, she did. I, I have a picture of Kristen Demira holding me as a youth for my birthday party mm. or something. Someone posted that the other day, and I was like, wow, okay, that's a little crazy. And you've obviously you're with Kristen now uh, on Days of Our Lives. Like I said, I've followed it for a while. I still haven't gotten over Madison James's death. Uh, I thought she was the perfect person for oh. you uh but a lot of the people have made this the crossover too you have uh rafe and arianda were both with you on passions and that's got to feel nice to be able yeah. to work with uh people you've worked with already when they bring them over like that absolutely and you you're i'm i'm so impressed with you james your, your knowledge of days you've really done your homework <laughs> thank you doing a good job um yeah it's easy to forget about brady brady has a a long list of you know female companions i mean it, I, i've been given the the nickname uh, brady black widow oh yes because he just tends to you know his wives just tend to perish or his this girlfriends or, or he, he gets engaged at the drop of a hat and then it, something tragic happened well, madison got exploded by a window yeah i believe something. so that was she when got shattered yeah, yeah there was a and huge ariana explosion. got hit by a car yep ariana got <laughs> Luck, <laughs> luckily shattered. melanie jonas just left town so she's safe at least Right, right. So these poor actresses, they find out they're working with Eric Martzoff. They're like, oh, crap, I really need this gig. Oh, man. But I'm like, don't worry about it. You can come back from the dead now. Thank, thank you to Dr. Ross. This is right. Exactly. We can have them all back at the same time, and then you can pick. It'll be like the dating game with Brady Black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's great. I know the soap opera, we've had several people from the soap opera on before, uh, from Young and the Restless, uh, People, a couple of people from Days of Our Lives. It is a grueling schedule. You're you're always at work. So <clears throat> when do you find time to do stuff like Digital Sky, Rideshare the Series? We're going to stop there, take our final commercial break, come back and continue our chat with Eric Martzoff. So please stand by. Hi, I'm Ken Trotter. I was the voice of the Green Arrow in the Justice League Unlimited. I play Scotty Baldwin on General Hospital. So when you're not watching General Hospital, listen to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back for our final segment on Geek to Me Radio. Chatting this uh, last couple of segments with actor Eric Martzoff, outstanding guy, great talent. Uh, you know him from Passions, from Days of Our Lives, from Smallville, so many other great projects. And we talked to him now that he's doing this ride share, this Digital Sky series ride share on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Uh, I asked him all this stuff he's doing. How does he find time for the ride share, being a celebrity, doing this and that, and balancing everything out? It's it's a juggling act. I mean. Tech James, even to talk to you right now, you, you know, I got to go record rideshare in like 10 minutes, but um, you welcome work. 
you know, in these times, I'm you're never I'm not going to bitch about being too busy. Yeah. Not when a lot of our acting community is is struggling right now and we're all just, you know, working for working for pennies when we used to work for quarters. And it's 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 hard. So you don't complain about being busy when you're an actor. If you're an accountant, yeah, you can bitch about tax season, but <laughs> no, I'm I'm not going to make a fuss about opportunity. I just juggle it around, you know, and I got a fa- I got fatherhood on top of that too. I got two 14 year old twin boys that wow. need got need guidance and attention. And I want to be there for them. I'm not an absentee father. You know, that's important. I'm raising men. And so to find, there's not enough hours in the day. There really aren't, but I'm trying. We're all out there just giving it our best shot. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, days of our lives, one of the uh, last holdouts of the soap operas it used to be like 12 on, uh, again, you've, you picked a winner with days of our lives. So it's great that you've got that gig. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it I got days of our lives eight months after passions folded mm-hmm. and that that's been my only real daytime break. Well, that and the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but those two time periods <laughs> were really the only time when I haven't been getting up in the morning and chucking my butt to Burbank or studio city and, and acting. Which, which is which is pretty incredible because you know even even movie stars they they'll do a movie for three months and then be off for seven months. Yeah, exactly. I, I haven't I haven't stopped. My my foot's been on the gas pedal since 2002. So are you are you one of those but, people who are able to relax? Are you able to like or is it, are you a person who obviously it sounds like you thrive on the work? Uh, are you are you able to let yourself relax and take that break? Yeah, I, it's 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 a muscle I've had to learn to train to relax mm-hmm. honestly but um I, I attribute my wife to that you, you need a partner in your life that balances you and she's good at looking me in the eye and saying babe babe yeah yeah okay take a breath i booked us a weekend in santa barbara we're gonna go and uh you're not gonna act at all you're just gonna be with me and be real <laughs> and be you and, <laughs> and we're gonna have a wonderful time we're gonna drink a lot of wine eat some crab and and yeah she always knows what i need before i do that's perfect. It's so definitely you need glad someone to have like, someone that, like yeah. that. Absolutely. Uh, I know you've got a hard yeah. out to get to your next uh, gig, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. We always play this game with our celebrities where we call it uh, this or that. I basically give you two choices and you tell me which one you prefer. Uh, we'll start off it. dark chocolate or milk chocolate. Dark chocolate. Chargers. And I, I grew up and I grew up at Hershey Park, so I, I, I know my Hershey chocolate. Then we'll take that as an expert <laughs> answer, of course. <laughs> uh, chargers or bears? Wait, chargers or bears? Yes. Uh, let's let's go L.A. We'll go chargers. And it, we have vacations at the beach or in the mountains. Take me to the beach. Sedan or coupe? <laughs> If you're stealing a ride, Jerry. You must have a preference. I got twins. I'll I'll be in the sedan. Gotta make room for them. And finally, Marvel or DC? Well, come on. <laughs> Gotta go with DC. Come on, Booster Gold, baby. I figured I'd end it on an easy one. So that was that was kind of a gimme. I was uh, I was hoping you wouldn't let me down. <laughs> I have respect for both, you know. But yeah, I got. I'm in. I'm in the family. You know, exactly. So I got to go with my family. Uh, it's been a blast to talk to you. I've always been a fan. Uh, you're a very talented actor, and I, I can always tell you bring a true grit to your work. Uh, we can catch you on Days of Our Lives on NBC as Brady Black, and of course, Digital Sky Ride Share the series. You can get it on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Eric Martzoff, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. James, you're you're a superhero yourself, man. Thank you so much for supporting, and I appreciate the time, man. That's going to do it. Another show in the books. My thanks once again to my guests, John Greasley and Greg King of King Soundworks. Check out kingsoundworks.com. And of course, make sure you check out their upcoming films, Little Things and Songbird, where they'll be doing all of the sound for that. Thanks again to Eric Martzoff. Make sure you catch him as Brady Black on Days of Our Lives on NBC weekdays. And of course, subscribe on Apple Podcasts and YouTube to Digital Sky Ride Share the Series, where you can hear him voicing Keith. And always, always thanks to Joey V, who makes these shows sound as good as they do. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I zombie. It's not in the way you watch The Flash. It's not in the way you love Scotty Young Art. It's not in the way you play Mario Kart. It's not in the
Thank you, Salem. Good night. Hi, this is James Enstall, host of Geek Me Radio, and in honor of my favorite Themyserian, I've decided to become an Amazon warrior. Hera, give me strength. The next time you want to buy something from Amazon, go to geektomeradio.com first and click on our Amazon affiliate link. Simply shop like you normally would, and when you check out, a small percentage will go towards supporting the show. So remember, the next time you want to search Amazon for the latest Wonder Woman graphic novel or parts for your invisible jet, <laughs> click through from geektomeradio.com first. The world was in peril. Would you have me stand by and do nothing?